Okay, so I think that's uh, most people logged on now. Uh, so welcome to today's webinar, Permanence Contract, the How, the What, the Why, uh, brought to you by Oliver James. Um, so today we are joined by Natasha Flynn, Jonathan Lord and Irene Kramer. So I'll hand them over to introduce themselves. Uh, Tash, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Natasha Flynn. I work as the Senior Contract Operations Manager across the Oliver James Group. Uh, so the contract operations team here at Oliver James, we onboard all of our contractors for their assignments and we ensure that all contractors have the best and smoothest onboarding process. And uh, Johnny, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Jonathan Lord. I'm a principal consultant here at Oliver James in the UK. and I manage our uh, UK non-life actuarial contract work. And finally, Irene. Yes, thank you. I'm Irene Kramer from the Oliver James Amsterdam office and I specialize in placing actuarial risk and quant consultants within the financial services in the Netherlands. Brilliant, thanks guys. And uh, how long have you worked in the contract world for? So I've worked in contract recruitment now since 2013, so this will be my ninth year in contract recruitment. Fab and uh, Johnny? Yeah, so this is nearly my fifth year now of uh, contract recruitment in the UK. So, yeah, started to knock on a little while. And uh, Irene? I started at Oliver James in 2019, so it's uh, it's been three and a half years now. Oh, well, brilliant. Thank you. It's great to all have you all on today's webinar. Uh, I'm Marion Reed, and today I have Steph Tyler with me and we will be hosting and facilitating this webinar. Um, today our speakers will provide insight into the differences between permanent and contract opportunities and how to determine the best route for you. Um, if we have enough time at the end, we will have an allocated Q&A session, so please feel free to use the chat tool as we go to submit your questions or tell us about any technical problems that you may experience during this session. Um, so let's begin the webinar. Um, Johnny, if I start with you, sure. um, how do you think the contract market has changed in, uh, in the last three years? Um, in short, a lot, um, but I'll, <laughs> I'll go into some detail. Um, I cover the UK contract market and some of this will be relevant to the UK. Other bits of it will be relevant to kind of more global trends and, and, uh, and kind of positions. But from a, from a kind of UK contract market perspective, we had a very major change in UK tax legislation a few years ago, which directly affected contractors. It's called IR35, I'm sure people on this webinar have heard of it before. Uh, it won't be anything new, I don't think, for lots of people. Um, but if it is, definitely worth looking into. Um, that had a fairly large impact on how contractors provide their services in the UK and how the kind of contracts are structured with clients, the payment, the tax, the kind of very important details around contracts particularly. Um, that will also be relevant to other jurisdictions globally. There will be kind of changes in legislations for contractors that will have impacts and there probably has been over the last three years. But I can obviously only comment for the UK. Um, secondly, over the last three years, I think we've really seen the growth of flexible working. Um, Pre-COVID, pre um, so kind of 2019 and earlier, flexible contracting wasn't really a huge area of the market. Um, you tend to see most people would contract for five days a week and they do that for six or 12 months at a time. Um, it's now very, very common, particularly in the UK, for individuals to contract on a part time basis, whether that's for six months of the year, then take the rest of the year off, whether it's three days a week, four days a week, you know, multiple contracts at any one time, you know, two days here, two days there. Um, and I've really enjoyed seeing the growth of that area and it's been something I've been really keen to kind of push with my clients and contractors, particularly if they do want to pursue it. Fantastic. And um, Irene, um, would you like to? Um... Yes, please. I actually recognise a lot from what Johnny is saying, uh, apart from obviously the very specific uh, legislation uh, in the UK, although uh, it does influence, I think, uh, the, the continent in Europe as well, uh, as it makes it a tad more difficult for us to work with English contractors, whereas in the past that wasn't so, so difficult to, to do. Um, well, in large lines, I would say pre-COVID, uh, the market, in my opinion, was fairly balanced. I would actually say that there was a little less supply than demand, so there were more contractors than there were positions for them uh, to be working on. Um, 
COVID stagnated the demand for, for contractors even more, I would say. However, since the beginning of 2022, uh, the demand has increased dramatically uh, due to a few factors. Uh, overall, in the Netherlands, there's a huge uh, shortage of uh, employees. There's so many vacancies. Uh, employment is very, very low. Um, so there is actually a high demand for permanent uh, employees. But if they aren't available, then those positions, uh, especially if they are required by the regulator, for instance, need to be filled in uh, by a contractor in his or her stead. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, so following on from this, looking at permanent and contract, what would you say are the main differences between uh, permanent and contract positions? Johnny, um, would you like to take this one? Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one first. Um, I think in some ways they're kind of two very different pieces and in other ways they're kind of quite similar. A lot of the time the work you're doing might not be hugely different to work you've done before. I think permanent work probably offers slightly slower progression because you have exposure to one business, one team, kind of one unit over a certain length of time. Whereas contract contracting, I feel over say a three or four year period gives you probably far greater exposure to a number of a variety of businesses, new technologies, different teams, new ways of working, you know, multiple projects. So I think the progression side can be slightly different between permanent and contract. Um, on the flip side, I think obviously there's probably one glaringly obvious point, which is that permanent work is indefinite. You're there for however long you want to be there. Contract work does have a, a, a time defined to it, time and material. Um, however, to kind of combat that slightly, I think the average permanent tenure for, for kind of particularly UK workers and probably global workers these days is probably at the lowest it's ever been. The average time people spend in permanent positions is, isn't actually all that long these days. Um, and that actually brings it more in line with contract work. We, we tend to see contracts are extended fairly frequently. I, I guess it's fairly rare that projects run to time and budget, as I'm sure everyone will <laughs> probably agree. Um, so we, yeah, we tend to see that obviously they're, they're kind of two main differences, particularly from my side. Fantastic. And um, Irene? Well, as always, I uh, uh, agree completely with Johnny, <laughs> except for a few uh, few parts. Um, in my opinion, actually, um, you should always start out your career in a permanent uh, position. Um, obviously, uh, you're new to the employment market. And you need to learn as many skills as you can. Um, you don't have to stay with the same company for 10 years, but um, a permanent employment is an investment on both sides, I would say. So you as an employee invest your time and energy into the company and the company is doing the same for you. They uh, teach you new skills. Maybe they will even uh, guarantee a certain amount of education uh, or, or degrees you are able to attain whilst you're under employment with this company. So if you start out, I would never recommend doing so as a contractor. A contractor is usually hired to fill in an immediate need. So it's very important as a contractor that you are uh, very skilled and have a certain expertise that the uh, that the uh, client can use immediately. So um, it's, it, there's not really time to, to teach you any new skills, so to say. So start out by, by learning as much as you can, I, I would always advise. And then once you've figured out your, your area of expertise, um, you can actually help so many other organizations uh, by applying that skill. And I think that ties into what Johnny says. As a contractor, you are hardly ever longer on a position than, well, let's say two years. And that's basically stretching it, um, which may be uncertain, but at the same time, this will open up your world and, and make you see so many kitchens uh, from the inside. <laughs> so I think those are the, the, the main two differences between the perm and contract. Amazing. Thank you both. Um, please remember, guys, if you've got any questions, just pop them in the chat tool on the side and we'll try and answer them once we are finished with our questions. Um, so uh, if I could ask um, Irene, what would you say the benefits are of uh, both contracting and permanent positions? I think it ties in with what I uh, what I already mentioned. So uh, please excuse me for for uh, <laughs> repeating myself. But the the brilliancy of contracting is being able to see so many organisations from the inside. Uh, you'll you'll be um, 
looked for by by clients to fulfill that immediate need. You can really show that you are the expert within your area. Um, and once you're really good at something, I'm pretty sure uh, you you like what you're doing. <laughs> so um, th this can be very pre pleasurable, actually. On the flip side, um, like I said, you're not somebody that uh, an employer would like to invest too much time and energy in when it comes to learning new skills. So you're really you have to you have to well uh, be very vocal about those you know if you want to learn something or if you want to do something different it's not going to come to you so you kind of have to do it yourself and if you're not careful you're going to end up doing the same assignment over over and over again so that's the balance that you need to take into account fantastic and uh johnny did you have anything to add to that yeah i think to to avoid the elephant in the room i think one of the immediate impacts of of contracting is the fact that you can increase your earning potential fairly significantly and that's uniform across most markets for, for the most part businesses are paying you more um, remunerating you more for the risk you take in not having permanent employment um, so we as a, as a rule of thumb um, I tell the contractors I work with in the UK that they should be able to fairly comfortably you know double their earnings um, it, it shouldn't be that difficult at all to do that I think from a benefit of permanent of the permanent world um you, you probably don't need to have as much of a handle on your personal finances and by that i mean obviously your um taxes pensions holidays um are kind of all managed for you essentially um i think people get very used to the kind of permanent structure where you can kind of take holidays and your pensions paid into your account and there's benefits with work which a lot of people kind of don't think about but as a contractor, you have to you have to kind of weigh that into your rate and think about that more and be slightly more assertive about it. Um, with contracting, I think one of the benefits we've seen over the years is that from a, from Oliver James' perspective, me particularly, I will work with contractors time and time again. Um, so we actually rarely see, particularly in my non-life actuarial market, we rarely see contractors out of work um, for any periods of time at all. And obviously we've done this for 20 years or so now, so it's great to work with contractors time and time again and secure them positions time and time again. Um, I know there can be an air of uncertainty around it, but I think obviously the, the kind of data that we have from over the years and, and the work that we've done kind of proves that it's actually a lot less uncertain than people think. Thank you both for those. Um, and looking at the other side, would you say there are any negatives of a permanent or contract position or not? Um, Johnny, would you like to go first? Yeah, um, I mean, they, they both have their positives and negatives. Um, that's understandable. Um, I think, as, as Irene says, it's obviously great. A lot of people start their careers in a in the in the permanent world, and it's a it's a great place to kind of cut your teeth and and hone your skills. Um, there is obviously a lot more kind of red tape when it comes to permanent employment, and by that I mean obviously you you sign a contract with an employer. You know, everyone signs similar contracts, everyone has the kind of same rules and, and opinions, whether that's remote working, whether it's flexible hours, whether it's there's a whole whole host of things that you kind of sign up for. Um, that's probably the one negative side of the permanent world. If any, if there's going to be any changes in those contracts or any changes in your working practices, it's generally a much larger decision. As a contractor, you're not generally employed by the end client. So in those cases, um, you have a lot more freedom over how you work which I think is great. Um, on the flip side, back to it again, I think, you know, negative of the contract side world was if, is you just have to be much more in tune with, you know, your rates, when you work, how you work, just kind of manage life around that. Um, and the only other thing I kind of add to it is uh, from a contract perspective, I think you have to be aware of the fact that if you're applying for mortgages or loans and various other things, you need to look at how contracting might potentially impact that. I would agree. I don't have anything to add, um, Marion, to, to Johnny's statement. I think he covered basically everything. I agree. Well, thank you very much anyway. Um, and thanks for the questions in the comments, guys. We'll try and get round to answering those at the end. Um, but on to the next. So when would you say, um, Irene, is the best time to make the change from um, a permanent position to a, a contract? Well, the easy answer is it really depends on your personal situation. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so I know uh, contractors that I work with who um, only recently bought their house and have a small baby on the way, for instance, and uh, and one of the you know the parental team still feels comfortable uh, working on his or her first contractor position, but this may not be the case for you at all. Uh, I, I know the the exact opposite as well, where somebody will say, you know what, I just need uh, a little more stability. Um, I. I really do not have the time or energy to be involved with uh, doing my own financial administration, for instance, uh, and it just really well makes me feel more comfortable uh, to work in an, uh, in a permanent uh, employment. As I mentioned before, um, I would always advise starting out your career in a permanent position. Probably do this for a year or 10 or so. I'm not saying you need to stay within the same company, like I mentioned before, but this is usually a fair amount of years that you can tap out of. Um, you know, I, I work with clients, so when I introduce somebody who is going to take care of their interim need, um, it really adds a lot more weight to somebody's profile if I can say that he or she has been doing this for 10 or more years. So that's probably a rule of thumb that I would recommend for somebody to uh, take into account. Great. And Johnny, did you have anything to add to that? Um, probably echoing what Irene's just said, really. Um, I think you need to kind of look at your personal circumstances, the skills you picked up over the years, where you kind of want to project your skill set, the kind of uh, the name you want to build for yourself in the contract market, because let's let's not forget that you are ultimately selling your own services to a to a client. So you need to be confident in what you're selling and it's, it's good to have a, a niche that you work within so you're known for that um i think the the time i mean when, when should you start contracting i think it really depends on on personal circumstances i think you need to weigh everything that we've kind of mentioned up whether it's down to kind of family life financial life mortgages loans you name it and work out you know is is the time right for me to do this do i am i confident with my skills and ability and, and speak to you know speak, speak to someone at Oliver James about that if you've got any questions on it but realistically you know we should be able to give you sound advice on on whether the time is is right or not having done this for a fair few years um it's it's really a personal decision and, and there's contract roles at, at, at all ranges and, and levels um they aren't just I'm sure I've seen a few questions coming on that and, and they're not just restricted to to kind of more more senior work um, but it has to be when the time is right, because obviously you want to kind of press on with it, make a good name for yourself and, you know, hopefully make a, a good career from it for however long that needs to be for you. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. And so when the time is right, Johnny, would you say that there are certain markets which make the uh, the move from um, permanent to contract easier? Or? Um, a good question. And it is a question that I think has is, is probably changed a lot over recent years. Um, I think globally, I think there's obviously a, a inherent shortage of, of skilled workforce at the moment in plenty of countries. I, I think that's been on most news channels around the world. Um, I, I think in general, obviously, the, the more specialist the market, the easier the transition is to move from a permanent employee to a contract employee. Um, pre, pre COVID here in the UK, uh, most clients would usually wait about a month for a contract to start. So most individuals with a three month notice, it was a difficult transition, frankly. It wasn't something that was easy to manage. But as we've seen, obviously, the kind of uh, the shortages in the skilled workforce appear post COVID. We're now seeing clients wait two, three months for contracts to start. So particularly within specialist markets uh, in the UK and globally, I think that makes the transition much smoother. Um, you don't always have to hand your notice in with nothing to go to, although that that used to be the case. Um, for, for most people here in the UK. Amazing. Thanks, Johnny. And Irene, would you would you say anything different or? I wouldn't say anything different. Um, maybe focusing more on what would be a difficult market to be a contractor in. It's pretty straightforward and I just would like to point it out very briefly. Um, if, if it's anything pertaining building up relationships over a longer period of time, if you have to manage a specific type of portfolio, uh, for instance, then these are an areas that I would recommend becoming a contractor in simply because of the nature of, uh, of the work. That's just something to keep into account. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Um, so on to the next. Uh, 
How does Oliver James uh, guide and help its contractors and how does this differ to the services offered to permanent employees? Um, Irene? Um, certainly. So, um, as we have in the Netherlands been working with many clients for a very long time, we're usually pretty aware of what they require for a contractor, uh, uh, his or her onboarding uh, with this specific company. And um, as we've been doing this for a long time as well, uh, we as Oliver James require certain documents and uh, specifications as well from a contractor, I'm sure. Natasha is uh, happy to explain this uh, in a little while. So uh, we can help you uh, explain what you need uh, very specifically. Uh, we can help you, um, you know, go to the, um, what we call it the, the KVK. It's uh, basically the Chamber of Commerce uh, in the Netherlands, can explain to you how that works. Um, explain to you which types of insurances you need and, and give you a, a broad overview of what the market looks like uh, as we're doing right now in this webinar. <laughs> Fantastic. And uh, Natasha? Yeah, just to kind of add on to what Irene said is that we do guide all of our contractors throughout the onboarding process. Um, I think one thing to take into consideration is that PERM contractors may have never dealt with things like IA35 um, you know, if, if they're deemed inside or outside and what that means for them and their assignment. Um, so we really guide them through that aspect of the onboarding. Um, again, adding to Irene that we're able to help with insurance requirements and documents that are possibly needed as, you know, again, PERM employees, they may have never experienced these requirements before. And what we want to do is try and make it as easy as possible uh, for our con contractors. I think, you know, the current climate as well is big in recruitment and we do help a lot of our contractors with, you know, remote working and ensuring that they're set up in country and that they're working compliantly as well. And obviously that they're protected, you know, as as much as Oliver James is guiding them through the process, it can still be quite daunting to, to a permanent contractor. So we just try and make them feel as easy as, mu as much as possible. Um, we're able to help with, you know, possible legislation change, like most recently the, the national insurance increase. Um, we're able to discuss what this means for our contractors, how their assignment can be affected. And I feel like that's something that is definitely missing for permanent employees is, is you know, the behind the scenes parts. And not only have they got all the support from us, we've got support from our extended back office and payroll providers that, that we work with for inside assignments. So, so I think that can sometimes lead people to not go into contracts is if they are, you know, deemed inside and what that means. But again, we've got some amazing payroll providers that we work with that can help them and can guide them through. Um, and I think another benefit is is just the point of contact within the global operations function is just having someone that's able to, you know, fast track any issues that they may be having or discuss paperwork or extensions throughout their assignment and we want to ensure that our contractors have the, the best possible service and we believe that that service should also continue on throughout the assignment and not just stop at the onboarding, um, which again, hugely differs to perm roles. Thank, thank you very much, guys, for those answers. Can um, I add to this, uh, Marion, really briefly? Because I feel can. like I focused on the beginning of the assignment rather than uh, uh, throughout the duration of the assignment. As Natasha mentioned, um, so we we have a responsibility towards the client, but as well as to the to the candidate. So what we're always trying to accomplish is to make your assignment uh, well as lengthy as possible. Because you know <laughs> nobody dislikes stability. I would say obviously uh, if you're still happy at your assignment, that that's a huge uh, requirement uh, for this. As well as um, if an assignment is ending, perhaps the project has run out of budget or it has just uh, stopped and it's all finished, we will actively and proactively, um, of course, in, in conference with the candidate, the, the, the candidate's profile to other clients that we work with within the same market. So it, it's not just a, you know, it's a business relationship, but it we in the Netherlands, especially within my team, especially within our niche markets, um, try to do our best to make those relationships as sustainable as possible. It is really important for us that you feel happy in your in your role and, and would very gladly continue 
uh, with us in your next position. And so I'm, I'm actually proud to say that this has worked out many times. And uh, we've been working with uh, with a few contractors for more than uh, four or five years already throughout the, the course of their careers. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, following on from this, um, Johnny, what support would you say we provide for those wanting to make the change? Um, I think in short, a lot of support, um, a huge amount of support from from various individuals within Oliver James. So, you know, from a first point of contact, such as myself, having worked in this market for years, to from Tasha's team, the wider compliance function. Um, I think it's really important to note that there's always that one point of contact within Oliver James, but there's there's multiple people behind that. So if there's ever ever a query about anything with regards to the change from permanent to contract, there is always someone to speak to who is you know, well versed and well educated in that in that kind of decision making process. Um, you know, the contract operations team here have been fabulous with me over the years. Um, you know, we've we've worked on some really interesting assignments globally, um, cross border compliance, various things that are ordinarily very complicated, but we don't shy away from kind of the, the complicated scenarios. It's something that you know, we actively you know, look into things. We're a global business. We enjoy the challenge. It, you know, it's part of our growth as well. Um, so I think that's probably the most important thing to note is that there's always someone at Oliver James to speak about any particular challenges or, or questions around the change. And undoubtedly, there will always be a, a sound answer for you at the end of that. Amazing, thank you. And uh, over to you, Tash, would you have anything to add? Um, yeah, again, just kind of looping in with Johnny is that obviously we are, a, we're a global contracts operations team. So we are able to cover many different countries and, you know, within that team, we have team members that have worked in compliance and onboarding from anywhere from two years to 15 years. So, you know, we, we know the industry very well now. Um, we have that global experience behind us to be able to advise our contractors from, from all over the world and ensure that we are working compliantly as a business and, you know, there are no worries. Um, I think from an onboarding aspect, like Johnny mentioned, our contractors can benefit from a designated contract coordinator who can take them through the, the whole of the portal and the onboarding process, so, you know, so they know exactly what to expect. Um, we guide our contractors through specific documents that's requested from our clients, but also documents needed to protect our contractors' business as well. Um, an example of this would be insurance requirements, you know, where to get the possible rates for our contractors and what it means for their own company when obtaining this compliance. Um, and as mentioned earlier, our onboarding process doesn't just stop when the contractor started an assignment. Our contractors can benefit from reminders, you know, of possible document expiries from the team or um, just anything like that to have that bespoke tailored service to their assignment. Um, I think another benefit that's included in our onboarding process as well is that Oliver James work with an array of providers, as mentioned earlier, our, our payroll providers, with some being able to offer things like financial advice, um, you know, for anything related from, from mortgages to just day-to-day -day management, which again, just loops into that kind of bespoke service that I think helps Oliver James stand out in the recruitment industry. Um, I know Johnny mentioned there that we've worked with so many contractors, but we've also worked with a lot of clients who stay with Oliver James. And, you know, with that, we've been able to look at our processes and continuously better them. And our onboarding team, we're always observing the service that we give our contractors. And with that, we're always looking for any gaps in our process, you know, any areas that we can improve, just again, so we can give the best service possible. And I think with that comes time and working with these clients for such a long time and able to, to provide that for our contractor base. Brilliant. Thanks, Natasha. Um, so hi, everyone. It's Steph um, Tyler here. Um, I'm going to be running through the Q&A uh, with you now. Uh, we've had quite a lot of questions through, so we'll try our best to cover off um, as many as possible. Um, there are a few that I think we will have to come back to you individually just because um, they're quite specific questions. So um, if we don't manage to get through to the, through them today, um, we will make, make sure someone gets in contact with you directly after the webinar. Um, so first things first, Johnny, um, I'm going to hand this question over to you if that's OK. Yep. Um, what is your view on the recession risk impacting contractual roles? Oh, economic theory. Here we go. Um, it's an interesting question, and I think it's one that we can only really look back to 
about 2008 on. Um, obviously, I think we, we, we've been operating as a business for 20 years now. Um, and obviously, we've seen a few, uh, few financial issues over the years and global recession and you know vice versa that came with it. I think it's important to note that I think any employment market is likely to be slightly impacted by a recession. There's, you know, there's, there's no beating around the bush on that from um, recessions aren't great things to have, then they're, they're not ideal. Um, you know, they don't provide great um, growth scenarios for lots of businesses. But the thing I'd add to that is that with, with individuals that operate in fairly niche markets, we'd be fairly confident in saying that a lot of these are fairly recession proof. Now, take that with a pinch of salt, that's not going to be the, the, the same across all markets globally. Um, but when it comes down to, to a recession, we also have to take into the fact that in a, here in the UK, and as Ari mentioned in, in the Netherlands, we have a global skill shortage of, of, of skilled workers. Now, the, the question we need to ask is how does that outweigh against the kind of recession risk on the contract market? I think it will probably balance out slightly. I don't think we'll see the probably biggest impact um, to the market, particularly here for, for what I cover in the UK, which is which is non-life actuarial work. Um, but I think any time will tell, you know, how long it drags on for, how long, you know, several global issues at the moment drag on for. I think obviously the longer it drags on, you know, the bigger, bigger the impact may be. But as it stands at the moment, I'm not personally too concerned. Brilliant. Thanks, Johnny. Um, so moving on to the next question, um, Irene, I'm going to come to you with this one. Um, what's the percentage split in between hands on operational contractors and business management advisory roles? Is it harder to find an executive management contract role? OK, those are uh, I obviously have a very uh, sharp percentage uh, split here for you uh, to answer. <laughs> no, but roughly saying, um, obviously, even it doesn't really matter if you're a, a permanent uh, employee or a contractor. There are always more operational roles available than there are managerial positions. Otherwise, the world would be upside down. Um, to make it specific for contractor work within my market, I would say that the split is probably 90% hands-on work and 10% managerial work. The reason for this is the nature of my market. Like I, I uh, focus on uh, placing contractors within the actuarial market risk and uh, the quantitative roles. Those are positions that usually involve projects on which work needs to be done, uh, regulatory issues, or or maybe somebody um, fell ill, or there is a, a pregnancy leave that needs to be covered. However, in Amsterdam, uh, we have a desk that focuses on change professionals. Um, I know from them that they place, well, for instance, project managers or project leaders, uh, as well as as heads of department uh, that can stay on for maybe, you know, two years to oversee an entire project. So from that aspect, that would be a little bit more managerial. But in general, uh, I I would actually, um, well, not warn, but <laughs> uh, tell everyone, uh, please be aware that there is just more uh, need for operational workers than there is for, for managers in, in this specific area, if that answers the question. That's great. Thanks, Irene. Um, so moving on to the next question, um, Natasha, I'm going to um, direct this one to you. Um, so how does IR35 impact UK contractors um, with a UK company working outside of the UK for UK companies slash clients? Um, so I think the, the first thing to kind of look at is that obviously IR35 it is a UK piece of legislation for UK contractors. Um, therefore, in you know, when we look at kind of a compliance perspective is what we look at is where the contract is actually domiciled. So, you know, if, if we have a contractor that's based in, I don't know, Turkey, for example, the IF35 wouldn't necessarily apply because they are going to be set up in country. Um, so with that, as mentioned before, what we look at and what Johnny mentioned is that we look at remote work in placements and how we can make that work. So, um, I think in, in answer to your question is, in short, is it, it doesn't necessarily affect them, um, but we will always work with our contractors to try and figure out how we can make um, make it work so that if you are working for a UK client, but you are in a different country, we'll ensure that we're always setting that contractor up compliantly. 
Brilliant. Thank you, um, Tasha. Uh, so next question, um, Irene, I'm going to come to you. Um, in 2020, I had an attempt on going permanent. Um, one question I have is what is the ma uh, minimum period of time I should be employed, which is reasonable to employer and acceptable on the CV? I think we did cover this earlier, but if you could just um, go through it again, that'd be great. Certainly. I think I mentioned uh, about a year or 10 or so. Uh, that to me is a is a good amount of time for me to be able to, well, roof to the the client that you've been within this area for a longer period of time and are probably very uh, well endowed within uh, uh, within the subject matter. Brilliant, thank you Irene. Um, so Johnny coming to you with this next question. Um, as a contractor are you limited to go for senior roles unless you've previously done a similar role in a perm position? Essentially do you need to go back in a perm role which is senior to then apply for similar senior roles in a contract capacity? Um, so, sorry, let me just rephrase that. As a contractor, you're, you're limited to go for senior roles unless you've previously done it. So they're saying that they are not senior at the moment and they're looking for a, a senior contract role. Is that right? Yeah. So do they need to have been um, worked in a senior position as a, in a perm role to go yeah. to a senior position in a contract position? Um, I think it's a really easy one to explain. Um, I think look at what the requirements are for a contract role. So the requirements for contract work are generally fairly black and white um people want to you know businesses want to hire an individual who can come in and, and do that from day one um as irene alluded to earlier it's not the best use of of uh, of businesses spends to be training contractors up who then leave so if hypothetically you've not partaken in a senior role before and there's a contract role which is a senior role unless you have kind of very similar skill sets or you've done something similar previously, I'd say it's probably a slight no go. Um, but then that all depends on the wider market, who else is interested, who else is available to do the work. Um, it's not uncommon for, for clients to kind of restructure roles, particularly if, if that particular skill set isn't available. R remember that contracts are, are quite flexible. So actually, if they say, right, we need to do a quick change, we, there isn't anyone available who's good enough to do the work at a senior level. Let's bring in someone slightly less experienced who can do more kind of operational work for us, and that might might solve a problem. Um, but I think it's as a, as a rule of thumb, I think it's quite difficult to apply for for contract roles when you haven't worked at say a level they require before, or with say a certain technology or a certain regulation, for example. It becomes quite tricky. Brilliant. Thanks, Johnny. Um, and next question, Natasha, um, I'm going to come to you. Um, so once a contract is signed, how secure is the role for the time frame the contract covers? With permanent jobs, there is a probationary period and once passed, the role is secure unless a redundancy process is undertaken. How does this work for contractors? Um, so I think, again, one thing to take into consideration is the fact that it is, you know, a contract placement. So things like probationary periods, they... Uh, you know, it wouldn't be great to put that in a, in a contractor's contract because they are a true contractor. And again, it loops in with what Irene mentioned earlier is that once you are a contractor, they do expect you to come in, hit the ground running, you know, where that probationary period's not necessarily needed. Um, obviously, once the contract is signed, that role is for that amount of time, you know, the start date, the end date, of course, it can be extended. And of course, on the flip side, it, it can be terminated terminated earlier if the project comes to an end earlier or, or anything like that however what we tend to do here at Oliver James is ensure that there's a notice period in place so you do feel more secure in your role and um, that can be agreed between the contractor and the client so by all means it could come to a close earlier but you know as Johnny mentioned I, th I think it was one of the questions earlier is a lot of the times our contractors are actually being extended rather than terminated earlier at the moment so um yeah again in short is that is the the time period that you'd be doing your role um but again we ensure that the the contracts are, are beneficial to the contractor as well Great, thanks Natasha. Um, I'm actually going to stick with you as well for this next question, if that's OK. Um, yeah. So what are the personal costs involved around contracting generally? Insurance, travel, equipment, etc. Mm -hmm. So insurance, um, again, we can loop in with our contractor base. You know, it, it definitely depends on the work that you do um, and the type of work that you, that you uptake, which will then depend on the outcome of, it, of things like insurance costs. However, 
what we like to do at Oliver James is ensure that you are getting the best rate possible. So we have a lot of providers that we can work with that can um, match any quotes that you have. Um, yeah, I'm not sure on the, the specific number, but yeah, they can, they can match the quotes that you may get from any other um, insurance companies. They can ensure that you get in um, the, the best on the market, ideally. So around the actual cost, I wouldn't have a number, but the stuff that we can do at Oliver James to make that process a little bit easier and a little bit, a little bit cheaper for our contractors. I'll um, I'll just jump in on that one as well. I think the <laughs> I think the costs really depend on what you're doing, where you're working, how long it's for, yeah. travel expenses. I think it's um it's something that you need to weigh up before you accept a contract. I think insurances in general are kind of fairly fixed cost. Obviously, there's there's different levels of insurance, different levels of professional indemnity cover and liability cover. Um, and there's different requirements from from role to role and client to client. But for the most part, I think the costs really do vary and need to be kind of weighed up on an individual basis um, because there's, there, there are so many variables on that front. Brilliant. Thanks both. Um, so, Irene, I'm going to come to you with this next question. Um, what is the development and trend regarding rates slash pay pre-COVID and now? What is the outlook? I'll cover what the development was uh, pre-COVID uh, first. Um, I think when COVID hit, mm, the market was insecure in general. And so uh, many projects were terminated. Many uh, employers were very hesitant to hire contractors or permanent employees uh, at the same time. And uh, what we noticed was a slight drip, uh, drop or dip rather in um, in what a contractor could um, uh, could ask for hourly. Obviously, uh, without traveling so much, uh, the costs for contractors were a little lower as well. So I think even if there was a slight dip, this evened out nicely uh, throughout the, the first period of, uh, of the COVID pandemic. As it went on, I think it fairly stabilized. Um, Right now, um, we are obviously dealing with a more economical recession. Me, I'm also not an economist, <laughs> um, but obviously um, things have become much uh, more expensive. Um, so I have noticed a few contractors raising their rates. Having said that, that does not necessarily mean that employees are too happy to raise the budgets uh, or are even allowed to or are or, or able to uh, raise project budgets. It's something it's just fixed for a, a future period of time. And um, organizations are typically a tad slow in picking up on, on trends when it comes to, uh, well, the, the need for, for contractors, for instance. Um, in general, uh, especially if you are going to be working as a contractor for the first time after a longer period of permanent employment, I would always advise against trying to get the most out of your first contract. This will come, trust me. It is easier for you to well, maybe dip a little bit under what is usual within your market so you can secure a position, get into the how, what and why of being a contractor. And then maybe after a year, uh, you know, see what is possible in terms of uh, increasing your rate rather than, uh, well, trying to go for it all uh, and ending up with, uh, with nothing or an assignment that you're eventually not happy with. That would be my advice if that answers the question, hopefully. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Irene. Um, so, Natasha, I'm going to come to you. Um, we've just got one more question after this. Um, so, can contra contractors work remotely from overseas? What is the level of opportunities available? Absolutely. They definitely can. And I think, as mentioned uh, previously, with COVID and the current um, climate, is that we are seeing a lot more remote workers, um, you know, with remote working what we tend to do is we look at the in-country legislation we look at um anything that we need to be aware of as much as our contractor again to ensure that they're working compliantly so 
we will always help our contractors to you know work with the best payroll providers in country to enable our contractors to work remotely from you know wherever it is that they're based across the world um so yes absolutely they they can work remotely and anything like that you know speak to your to your consultant who will come to the contract operations team and we'll all work out together and be able to to facilitate such placements Brilliant. Thanks, Tasha. Um, and last but not least, Johnny, um, I have the final question coming your way. Um, so is the financial remuneration uh, now much smaller with IR35 and rates staying stable on the contracting side versus what you can earn going perm, um, including benefits like holidays, pensions, bonus, etc.? Yeah, good question. Um, it's another one of those questions where it really kind of depends on where you're up to and kind of where you sit as an individual. Um, I think it's worth noting in the UK that I, I personally don't think IR35 rates have stayed stable. Um, I think we've, particularly in my non-life actuarial market within the UK, we've seen a fairly large increase in the inside of IR35 rates. I don't necessarily think that you're, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that you're financially better off inside IR35, but I think it's, there are certain, certain circumstances now where we're seeing kind of net net neutral take home pay compared to self employed outside of IR35 contracts. Um, but on that point, separately around the question, um, I think you kind of need to weigh up where you are in the kind of permanent ladder, what your benefits are, what your bonus is, what your pension contributions are, and then work out if contracting is, is financially viable. I think for the most part, contracting will offer a higher remuneration than, than permanent work. That being said, if you're the managing director of a business and you have huge incentives and a very large take home pay, then obviously there's probably a, a certain certain circumstances where it's not as financially beneficial. But I think for the most part, it should be the, the, the contracting remuneration should outweigh the permanent remuneration up to a certain level. And that, that certain level is usually you know, very, very senior leadership roles. Well, uh, fantastic. Thanks for that, Johnny. Um, and with that, it concludes today's webinar. Um, so we hope that you found today's content interesting and useful. Um, and thank you to our speakers, Irene, Johnny and Natasha, and to everyone who joined us today. If we've been unable to answer your questions during the session, we will contact you directly with an answer to your query. Um, and over the next couple of days, please keep an eye out on our LinkedIn page for a di direct link to today's recording. So that's it from us. Uh, thanks again for tuning in and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you all. Cheers. Thank you all. Thank Bye. you guys. Bye.